In animation, the Microsoft logo bursts into clear, concentric windows. Colorful, rounded fabric squares converge, spiraling upward. Microsoft. Ability Summit. Accessibility meets productivity and agility in the workplace. Hector Minto, Tucker Dupree, Rachel Hyam, and Gary Sherman. Welcome to Accessibility Meets Productivity and Agility in the Workplace. My name is Hector Minto. I'm the lead accessibility evangelist here at Microsoft. You know, we've learned a lot about how to amplify accessibility within business over the last few years. But often the amazing work of accessibility teams and disability inclusion strategy leads doesn't get the limelight that it should because we don't reach the leaders who can really help us scale our efforts. We talk about journeys in accessibility and the importance of a stakeholder map. We're going to talk today with different stakeholders driving their efforts and helping organizations scale their commitments to accessibility. It's a complex topic, accessibility, but whether I meet NGOs, government organizations, big corporates around the world, everybody's on their own journey of learning, their own journey of improvement, their own journey of commitment. And so when I was assembling this panel thinking like, well, who could we have the most interesting discussion with this year? I thought back to the orgs who'd really kind of woken me up to new ways of delivering this, you know, reaching different parts of the business and also maybe people who'd kind of had different aha moments about the stuff they could do and the impact they could drive. Uh, so I hope you're going to enjoy the next 45 minutes of discussion, conversation. I know you're going to take away some tips and tricks. And what we really want you to be able to do at the end of this session is go and have that conversation with your leaders, uh, build your stakeholder map in maybe a slightly different way. So let's get to know our panelists. Uh, I'm going to turn first to you, Tucker. Hey, Tucker. Hey, what's going on? So what I need to know from everybody as we intro here is, what do you do? How do you impact accessibility? And what was your maybe your aha moment where you thought, hey, I can make a change here? Tucker Dupree. Yeah, so thanks so much. Um, I am the Workplace Colleague Experience Lead for the Americas um, for BP. And my role day to day is how do our colleagues interact with the workplace? Um, that's through technology, but also through different types of events. Um, and for me, I was introduced to accessibility actually in 2006. Um, and that is due to the fact that I acquired um, a disability where I lost 75% of my central vision. And so for me, it was something that I was actually forced to move into this because of the fact that this new accessible technology would now fill the void of my vision loss. This all happened in 2006. I was handed the state of the art technology at the time, which was a magnifying glass for my flip phone, a monocular <laughs> to see far away, and all of those different things that sound super archaic now. Fast forward to 2023, all of those different devices that were filling the void of my vision loss at the time have now been rolled up into a smartphone, into my computer. And now all of those different pieces of accessibility give me back my independence. And all of that happened through the amount of time from 2006 to now. Um, but just because I use accessible technology also doesn't make me an expert in all things accessibility. Um, so I think that it's expanding that knowledge and making sure that we continue this conversation um, to really make that movement happen. Got it. Uh, I bet you still use the magnifying glass occasionally, right? <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> okay. It's just something uh, well, about it. <laughs> that's right. So uh, let's turn to Rachel. Hey, Rachel. Hey, Same Hector. question. Rachel Hyam. Thank you, Hector. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Hyam. I'm the global CIO of WPP, the creative transformation company. And I guess my role is to partner with a CPO to help improve accessibility through everything we do at WPP. My interest in the topic was really sparked very young. One of my cousins has Down syndrome, and I was super aware of how, my, how hard my uncle had to fight to get her the same access to education, healthcare, social and sports activities as my brother and I enjoy. I remember asking my parents about why that was and getting really angry and protective. And I guess that's stayed with me ever since. A few years later, uh, I uh, realized just how impactful technology could be to help improve accessibility when I was teaching skiing to children with visual disabilities. And I started to use technology, just simple things like a walkie talkie, headphone, mm -hmm. um, 
Wi-Fi buzzers um, and even video cameras to to shoot their their footage, um, and really saw how much that was that really leveled their experience, enabled them to accelerate their learning, and and I was able to teach them slalom, which was fantastic. So um, ever since I started my technology career, I felt it as a deep responsibility to remove any friction, any pain points, any barrier um, around accessibility in our workspaces. Amazing, amazing. Uh, and I remember, I mean, if we think back Microsoft's journey with WPP on this topic, you know, we've really started from kind of, you know, a blank sheet of paper on this topic, you know, a, few, a number of years ago. And you've come in with mm -hmm. all that kind of personal passion for it. It's just been such a great, great match. I love it. Yeah. It's um, great job. yeah. So, uh, Gary, over to you. Gary Sherman. Excellent. Well, first, thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and honored to be uh, presenting when talking with Tucker and Rachel. Um, so my name is Gary Sherman. I'm a vice president, senior director of technology for Liberty Mutual. I run an organization known as Digital Workforce Enablement. We're really responsible for the engineering of our traditional laptops, our desktops, uh, our Mac and mobile devices, VDI, and more specifically, all the productivity apps that drive the communication and collaboration across the organization. Organization. And the reason I bring this up is a lot of folks in this role get really passionate and excited about delivering technology to people at the right time and at the right place so that they we can enable them to do their job, make them highly productive. We love seeing the smile on their face when they're able to do their jobs. And so as you start to think about accessibility and the journey that I've been on, it really kind of fits right into that model. And it was just another group, another persona of folks that I could help be, enable to do their work. And so it's something I'm just very passionate about. And for the last 10 to 15 years of my career, I've been in this space and, and really just enjoy helping people, again, become productive in their roles. I think people need to hear this. Yeah. You know, it's like all too often people think, hey, it's IT, you know, <laughs> and, and like, I know like, through my career, it's like, come on, you know, it's like the IT team. But the idea that an IT team get excited about the experiences they build for their colleagues, we don't always have that conversation, yeah. you know, not enough, not enough. Yeah. I remember an article a few years back that was talking about how the CIO can really change the culture of an organization by the tools it provides. And, and I, that really resonated with me because every IT team I meet, and we light mm -hmm. up this conversation around accessibility. They're like, we want to deliver this stuff. We want yeah. our colleagues to see this stuff. So it's like, I, I, Gary, I remember that call we had when we first yeah. met. I was just like, it's like we were like we'd known each other years. After an hour, <laughs> it was like like we were like so tuned in to kind of what we what we Absolutely. wanted to do. So yeah, and, and I really want people to take that message away. You know, IT teams are not blockers. You know, if you're working in colleague experience and building tools, people want to build those tools that work for people, but. We've got to be braver in the disability community. We've got to be braver in the ERGs. We've got to be braver from HR and DNI to knock on the door. And like, let's just start a conversation about what we can do together, recognizing that it's a journey, right? So I'm going to turn to our first question. You know, we're, we're living in kind of quite a difficult time, actually, around, around, around the world in terms of how much spend people have. You know, people, projects maybe are kind of being, being closed that weren't being closed a few years ago. You know, there are, there are challenges out there. And so... We're hearing a lot from people about this this concept of doing more with less, and and so maybe just kind of I'm going to come straight back at you, Gary. But but you know how does that feel right now, and and what, how do mainstream technologies support an organisation to think about you know what it can do from what's kind of in the box? Yeah, no, certainly. You know, well, Liberty Mutual has a well-established accessibility program. Um, this program has really been focused on application accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, and so historically, as people needed accommodations for whether it be hardware, the operating system, or uh, the productivity suite, so like Office 365 or uh, Microsoft Office, they had to go talk to their manager, they had to go talk to HR, and they'd open a case, and they would get routed to my team, and we'd create custom solutions for them, right? Those mm -hmm. become expensive, hard to manage, hard to support going forward. So I saw this as a huge opportunity in the organization to mainstream the program. And what we've been focused on at Liberty is how do we make a standard catalog that everybody can consume, not just people who need an accommodation. We wanted to make all the accessibility tools available to everybody in the organization. Okay. So for the last year, we've been hyper-focused on that. And I'm proud to say today, if you go to our standard purchasing catalog, there's a category for accessibility, standard okay. workflow, is just like requesting any other piece of hardware. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is really getting return on the investments that we've made in the tools. And, and Hector, you, you and I have spent a lot of time on this. Um, 
it's remarkable the inclusiveness of your designs in the Microsoft suite. There are so many tools for accessibility just built into the operating system, built into Microsoft that people don't know about. So we're trying to educate, move people into that. And I have an example uh, every day that I personally use um, for Outlook. Uh, I love to use the dictation tools to help me. So what I do is I turn on dictation, I'll walk around my office, I get into more of a state of flow and I'm able to interact and quickly respond to emails. That tool was not built for productivity. That tool was built specifically for an accommodation of accessibility, but yet everybody can leverage it to be productive. So those are just some great examples of how we're mainstreaming and how we're looking at this, doing you know more with less. Yeah, this is a sea change actually for organizations where it's not just helping people who asked for it, but helping people who kind of, you know, just just increasing discoverability actually is what is what we're trying to do. And Rachel, I know you've done some some amazing stuff here. Perhaps you could share what, how you feel about making sure people know about this stuff. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Our core ambition at WPP is to be the most creative company on the planet. And we can only be that when we are able to foster fantastic diversity in our people and an inclusive environment where it's effortless for everyone to be at their most creative. So we absolutely believe that accessibility features help everyone be more productive, to collaborate and communicate better, not just colleagues who have disabilities. One of the outcomes we're driving really hard at the moment in IT is uplifting our digital experience for everybody as they use their devices. So we have have um, our disability inclusion task force right at the heart of our design squads, co-designing the entire experience around device provisioning and the tool chains we put on that device. And that team has decided to make the landing page of every new device when you open it fresh out of the box um, have a QR code that takes you right to our accessibility guide, highlights all the features on the device that you can use, uh, where to order adaptive equipment, um, or even be able to pick it up yourself from the nearest vending machine and find further support that you might need. So we're putting it right at the start of the onboarding journey or the sort of device refresh journey. A vending machine for assistive technology. I Why mean, not? Like who, yeah. what, who doesn't want that? <laughs> and this destigmatizes the tech, right? You know, with the fact that it's kind of mainstream, it's a whole audience. We've got to be super careful that IT teams understand the need for specialist assistive technology, the need for support. You know, the Disability Answer Desk plays a role there to support organizations with people who really do have that kind of, you know, that, that third party tool. Uh, but destigmatizing assistive technology, making it readily available hitting everyone with it, not just hitting those who kind of put their hand up. I, that is so different to the, the, the world I grew up in. Uh, Tucker, this must make your heart sing, right? It does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> More than you know. <laughs> and, and and so when I, when I, when I kind of linking it back to, to what you do, you're all about colleague experience from an HR angle. How do we, how do we make sure that this amazing work that's being done by IT leaders reaches HR? What more do we need to do? You know, what are the partnerships that we need to broker there to kind of really kind of land the message properly? Yeah, so NBP, um, our BRGs actually move mountains. <laughs> and <laughs> I am one of the one team leads for the accessibility BRG for the Americas. And the power of that with NBP is that it really speaks to our culture of how our leaders support our BRGs. And now that workplace and the team that I am on sits under our people and culture part of our business, which would be traditional HR. And to me, it's such a special place for us to sit because of the fact that we support the new builds for offices. We look at that colleague journey, whether it's uh, you know, how do you check into our offices? What does that journey look like? How do you get greeted by our staff? And really making sure that we're accommodating people's needs from the moment you step foot within VP. So I think that leadership giving our teams that space to have that mm -hmm. conversation and support the BRGs really is like that sweet spot because BRGs are on top of our day job, right? It's a lot of people that are passionate about yep. things. Yep. So for us, it's it's asking people to participate and leadership giving you that freedom to say, hey, yeah, if you're passionate about that, I support it. And I think that's really where you see that, that nexus of success of continuing that conversation across the whole business. And, and if I think to the role of BRGs, as in, you know, the, the, the impact a BRG can have on an organization. A lot of BRGs, we call them ERGs, I'm sure the different different terminology we can use. Uh, but the impact you have on the organization is not always, it's not always clear, you know, and people kind of, you know, they're having their conversation as a community. But the more I speak with the ERGs, we're having a conversation like, how can you drive change within your organization, the sort of change you want to see? And 
should we go and knock on the door of different departments to have this conversation uh, about technology? So, yeah, I, I think what we what I take away from this, the start of this conversation uh, is leaders are doing something. People are innovating. People want to build great experiences. But the partnership with the ERG to really get the message out and the empowerment that ERGs take from that in terms of feeling like they can impact and drive change within the organization creates this virtuous circle of kind of impact. Um, I, I don't think we can get away with doing more or less without talking about hybrid. Mm -hmm. So maybe could we have a just quick chat about kind of how did how did mainstream technology helping people in a new and a new part of work or working from home for the first time. Do you have any stories to tell there about how people just lent into the in, into the mainstream tech? Does anybody want to come in on that one? Sure, I'll come in on that. I mean, I Thanks, think as we, as we um, went into lockdown and we're all forced onto to Teams, uh, you know, 24-7, I think the um, accessibility features helped make that experience inclusive for everybody, whether that was the raise hand feature, the transcription, yeah. the, uh, the, the, the auto editing. It, it just made it feel more equal for everyone. I think now as we've got some people back in the office, some people still remote on Teams calls, we're still mm. learning the etiquette and the way of using those Definitely. features to really make that an inclusive experience. Just just making sure everyone turns their camera on rather than using a, an end of room camera, for example, helps to make it feel everyone feel they have equal voice and equal presence in, in the room. So mm. I think we're still learning in the truly hybrid world. I think it was much easier when we were all at home, um, but we're, we're still experimenting our way forward but the accessibility features make it easier for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Tucker, think, how, how did it go for you? I was going to jump in on that because I think um, just kind of to also build, it's it's the less is more in a hybrid world, right? Like turning on your camera for people that would be hearing impaired to not just have that personal interaction, but they normally probably read lips when they're face-to-face. -face. So mm -hmm. it's thinking through simple solutions to really have that opportunity to say, hey, this isn't a feature that is, you know, red lights, this is built for accessibility. It's actually something that's a super small accessible accommodation that you might not even realize you're doing it. So I think it's kind of getting out of that, am I camera ready attitude and saying, no, but I'm accessibility ready. And I want to make sure that everyone can participate throughout this meeting. I think that that just came out naturally. So I think that that's where you get the secret sauce of like making it so that it's not super in your face, but it is an accommodation that can help. Yeah, and the credibility of that message is best delivered often by partnership with the ERG. That's the other thing we saw. So IT teams getting that message back to people about new way of working, some of the tips and tricks. Gary, we, we did some great webinars with your with your team uh, to, 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 to explore this topic. But one of the things you were really clear was partner with the ERG, you know, make sure that Microsoft partners with the ERG to deliver this message because it shouldn't be IT dictating how people work. It should be a, a confident yeah. back and forth between community and IT. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I think about and going back to kind of the hybrid question was when the pandemic first started and we all went home, we all had to quickly from an IT perspective, assess our tools and figure out what are some of the new things that we can leverage to make a better experience. And the best part about that is, is over the course of the pandemic, we did improve the experience, but now it's shifted our cultures permanently. There are a lot of tools like transcription that we just turn on natively now. We never did that mm. before. And so we right. learned a lot and we're forced to learn a lot and we're forced to push our vendors and service providers to help us along that journey. And I do think everybody benefited from that in that sense that the technology and our cultures have shifted to be more accommodating for all during these meetings. Mm. Um, so that's something we learned. Yes, really, really great learning. Um, so we're going to talk now about accessibility testing. And and <laughs> I know <laughs> everybody's favorite topic is going to shock everyone, but we're going to start with Tucker. And, and there's a reason I want to start with you, Tucker, because I, I think we've got a, a, a great knowledge of assistive technology within the disability community. People know the tools they love, but actually having some empowerment within BRG, the RGs, to understand how do we know whether something's accessible or not? It, it, it's really something that we talked a lot about over the last uh, over the last year or so. Like, how much have you learned in the last year about testing for accessibility? <laughs> um, I want to learn more, but I think the biggest is that um, I think just kind of my journey actually coming into BP because previously, before I worked at BP, I was a professional athlete traveling on the Paralympic team. I had an amazing opportunity with that experience to travel the world with Team USA and see very accessible environments and not so accessible environments. Yeah. And I try and like 
channel those teammate experiences that I saw out in the wild when I'm walking around the world that we realized that wasn't built for people like myself with disabilities. So with that, I'm not an expert in all things accessibility. So Hector, when we started talking about this, I was, you know, asking questions like, is there any tools that you recommend that you think is like the golden standard or what websites do you guys look to and say, hey, that's what we're going after or we're already there. And you shared, you know, the accessibility checker, accessibility insights. And I think that those tools are such a great way to build that baseline when we're starting to test things because it's already checking, you know, the back end of, you know, HTML, the IRA tags, like all the different flows that you have within like web development spaces. And as a person with a disability, I can't expect the able-bodied community to just understand the expectation of the accommodations I need. So an example that I always like to give is if I go into a traditional meeting room now where, you know, you're sitting at a board table, there's a presentation down at the end of the table on a screen, an accommodation I simply ask for so that I can follow along with that presentation or that PowerPoint on my computer, I just, at the beginning of the meeting, hey, can someone send me the deck so I can follow along with my screen reader? And that simple question ha- literally unlocks that barrier now where I get to participate and follow along. And it's how we create that conversation to where it's not something that it's, you know, everyone has to stop and it feels like we've kind of, you know, everyone's ex- emotional or like feels like it's something that, oh, no, we didn't do that ahead of time. It's, no, hey, that's fine. Can I have that presentation now? So those types of checkpoints and having those things built into systems changes our ways of working, but also makes it feel like you're setting that level playing field by getting the basics right before we even start to talk about testing. We've already checked it with a lot of AI tools to make sure that we're already there with that foundation. I I think it's the bit I love most about our conversations, like watching you kind of go, ah, this is how I check for it. But this (laughs) idea that, that, that you also built a confidence to ask other people to check the accessibility of something before a meeting like that's not for everybody yeah but but you need to be in an organization as a culture where it's okay to ask and it's not going to be met with any you know with any with any barriers unnecessary barriers you know again role of the brg you know you sit in hr right tucker yeah so so hr people who know about accessibility testing and know that documents can be accessible i think is a you know it's a really good takeaway for organizations as, as, as we think about building this so, Gary, I'm just going to turn to you. I mean, you must feel great when you see or hear <laughs> Tucker talking about this. It's like people, one of the things we learned from the education stuff is there's a group of people who have an expectation of accessible experiences. Yeah. Definite recognition at this point, as we said at the top, that we know across big enterprises that not everything's accessible. So, like, no, there's no kind of, you know, there's no, everybody has to recognize that from the top. But it's much easier, I'm, I'm guessing, to kind of drive a conversation about the need to build accessible once people know that there's an audience that internally that that, that requires it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, we do a lot of this through education. So, Hector, as you're well aware, we have a strong ERG program at Liberty that we use to promote all DEI conversations at scale. And that's a big mm-hmm. piece, right? We got to drive it across the whole organization. Um, and so for us, when we were starting the conversation with you way back, one of the things that we figured out was we need to educate our people. We need to couple with those ERGs and bring forth so that there's an awareness so that people could ask for the right tools so that we could put the right processes in place to mm-hmm. deliver these tools. So again, as you're aware, we created the series that we focused on enabling accessibility options in core operating systems, in the productivity suite. And those have been met with great reception. People are really loving these and they're taking advantage of that. But now we're getting a lot more critical feedback because there's an awareness, right? And so we're actively listening, we're actively acting, we're actively learning every day due to the educational campaigns and due to the work that we're doing, which is driving some of the things I talked about a little bit earlier, such as we're now creating tools that people need. We're not guessing. We're not out there saying one person's coming, let's do a one-off. We're not guessing that maybe they might need these. We now have quantitative feedback. We're working with legal, compliance, medical to make sure that we're bringing forth the right tools and technology to deliver to the right people at the right time. So for us, a big part of our process is education and feedback. Well, I hear here, honestly, and, I, and I, 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 it's such a great story. Once, once, once you create that critical mass of knowledge of the features, you drive more 
criticism and you're not sitting there gary going i don't want it you're saying i embrace that feedback yeah. like i want it I, because it, it empowers me mm-hmm. as a leader to kind of make this demand of my team and bring real yeah. bring it I, I i use this phrase this is us so quite often yeah. when we're talking about the products we build and the websites we build and the apps we build for the public yeah the, the, the citizen the consumer it's a it feels maybe an abstract concept potentially for a dev to think about who am I building this accessibility tool for? Who am I who am I thinking about? The minute you know it's us, you know, it's 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 a Liberty Mutual colleague, it's a WPP colleague, it's a BP colleague, it just changes the the mentality of it, you know? And, and then I'm sure you've discovered people who care about this topic within your team putting their hand up to kind of, you know, lead some of these things because you're having that more human, personal conversation about it. That's been a remarkable outcome. Every time that I get a public forum and I'm speaking about accessibility, I'm just shocked at the amount of people who raise their hand and say, can I be part of this? How can I help? And before when we didn't talk about it, people didn't take that option. And so, yeah, there are a sea of people out there who really want to dive in and help uh, with this initiative. Amazing. Right. So, Rachel, similar similar question. I mean, you know, you, everything you build for your customers, you know, when you do client engagements now, you're thinking about accessibility. We're seeing it more and more. Uh, you need to build this muscle of, of of being able to build accessible in your organization. Absolutely. I mean, every time we build a solution for our clients and their customers, they have to be ultimately accessible. So we're incredibly rigorous about the amount of testing we, we do there. And we've also built a range of solutions for our clients to be able to assess the accessibility of their, their own websites, their own applications, yeah. their own mobile solutions, for example. Um, and we have you know, internally, I think we're, we're on a journey around accessibility of our own enterprise applications. You know, we have yeah. pockets of brilliant practice, such as our W. PP open data and tech marketplace where the underlying platform as a service um, has a design schema for every one of our agency brands uh, that our developers use when building those data and tech solutions for clients. And every single feature of those design schemas, whether it's a button or a font or um, uh, you know, like a coloration of, of an element, has been thoroughly pre-tested for accessibility. So our developers, even with very little knowledge around accessibility, can build with confidence. Um, we also have areas where we're layering in accessibility testing uh, on our more traditional enterprise IT estate, such as our ERP deployment. Mm-hmm. There, we're actually insourcing and building our own QA and test team for the first time for our ERP space. And uh, accessibility testing has been built into that uh, operating model right from the very beginning. And there are many areas of our legacy estate where we've got to start, um, but we've, we've got, you know, we're working towards embedding it everywhere. It's amazing. Uh, 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 so when I talk about this with clients, customers around the world, I talk about three horizons, horizon one, awareness, horizon two, build, horizon three, innovate. And you're doing some amazing innovation on client work and accessibility. And you've done your brand guardian testing tool. I love that. I featured that on one of our sessions at Inspire this year. Uh, this, this, This concept of permission to admit what's wrong comes from leaders. Yeah, I, I I cannot tell people enough how leaders help people feel OK about the fact that it's not perfect, but ex- make, make expectations moving forward and that that expectation starts with knowledge and awareness. I think this, this is so important. And I think maybe p- for the audience watching, I really want to just focus on this point. Rachel, you're the CIO. You know, this yeah. is not the accessibility team, you know, <laughs> saying I want everyone to build accessible. And I meet accessibility teams every day who are screaming for attention in their organizations because they want to see the change. But you have embraced the topic and therefore it makes it easier to unlock and make progress without being perfect. Uh, you it know, does. Uh, you know, we started by training our entire IT team on accessibility fundamentals. We've then woven inclusive design practices into our design thinking approach, and we've trained over a thousand colleagues in that. And then we've published a disability inclusion playbook, so all our line managers are aware of the support that's available for any of their colleagues that that need um, accessibility assistance. You know, we're doing things like removing recruitment barriers. We're piloting a guaranteed interview scheme in IT where those with a recognised disability who meet our essential criteria 
criteria will automatically get an interview. So we're being relentless about weaving accessibility into every element of the, of the fabric of our organisation. And, you know, we at the in IT are at the vanguards. We're lucky because our disability inclusion uh, task force chair is our digital workplace director. So, you know, his day job yeah. comes together with a personal passion around uh, around disability inclusion. So, um, you know, it, it's finding those individuals in your organisation that can be those advocates and champions and, and really start to make a difference. And this leadership conversation, you know, it's easier for you to build stakeholder relationships in an organization and drive some demand from an organization that is potentially for people who are kind of lower down in in, in organizations. You know, mm. you can pick up a converse, you can pick up a conversation with the CHRO, the CFO, you're gonna have that conversation. The CEO, I know, is really engaged in this topic at WPP, mm. right? So so the fact that you're able to pick up that phone and have that conversation, that makes everything so much easier. Whilst rec- whilst understanding that you know it's a journey, it's a journey for it's a journey for every organisation. I mean, partnership is big, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, building your stakeholder map, understanding how you can support other parts of the business from an IT perspective. Could we could we talk about that for a moment, Rachel? Could we just stay with you? Yeah, I mean, we we see this as absolutely a team sport. Um, yeah, you know, we, we in IT have a great partnership with our Disability Inclusion Task Force, thanks to my DWP director, you know, chairing it. But then we work closely with our um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and culture chain team teams in our people organisation. We work very closely with our innovation team in our CTO organisation, our inclusive design teams, our industry customer teams. We're developing solutions for clients, and I think it's the the power of those different disciplines collaborating that that builds you know fantastic solutions and spot opportunities that would never have emerged otherwise. I think one great example of the power of that collaboration um, comes through in the seeing AI work that we've been doing in partnership with Microsoft and with Halion. And and this is so inspiring. It's a very simple hack to make product information audible for those living with sight loss. It just uh, is all about having barcodes on pharma products that can be scanned and basically speak the ingredients, how to take the medicine and the side effects. You know, it's a brilliant example of eliminating friction points that would not have come about had we not had this fusion of disciplines and thinking, that intersectionality uh, come through. It's it's brilliant. Yeah, I remember I, I've been working with that project a lot this year. Do you know, Ray, I'm just going to share something with the with the audience here. I've been screaming for ages that seeing AI, the app that was designed for people with low vision, blind, to Mm -hmm. to be able to access products, access everything, was perfect for people who just couldn't read tiny fonts on on devices. Yeah. And and as Microsoft, we could scream that as high as we uh, as loud as we want. But until the WPP took it to to Halion and applied it to you know consumer healthcare, suddenly Mm -hmm. everyone went. Nobody can read those labels. Like, exactly. like, like, I can't. You know, and, that, and, that's, and that's the beauty of inclusive design. But we don't get to say the inclusive design story as much, I would say, unless it reaches a real, you know, an industry, a different industry. Yeah. I think and that's been brilliant about the partnership with, with WPP is that you help us reach other people with our technology, not just living in the IT space. This is inclusive design. Tucker, you and I, when we were talking before this, we were we were talking about the beauty of inclusive design is that, is that you can you can do it in stages. You know, it doesn't all have to be perfect. And you told me an amazing story about medals at the Paralympics. I just want to <laughs> I just want to make sure we cover it because I just loved it. And I bet I bet people don't know this. So please, like, share that. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So um, obviously, the Paralympics take place right after the Olympics. Um, a couple of weeks later, I always make the joke and I'm, that I'm thankful that they take the time in between so they can clean the village. Um, so for us, um, we stay at the same places you see all the you know marquee athletes take place for the Olympics. We're just a couple weeks later. And I had the amazing opportunity to stand on the podium in 2012 and receive this silver medal. Um, and the accessibility just built into this medal alone, um, I think is amazing in the aspect of there's Braille across the top rim. There's textures on this metal that are very tactile to where all the logos are raised or embossed. On the bottom of the metal, it's engraved that tell you what event that is for. And that was my 2012 experience. Going into 2016, which actually built even a better layer of accessibility into it, is this metal, which is a bronze metal from um, my 100 backstroke, where the actual metal has an audible thing that actually you can hear. So... As you We're shake it, okay. Um, as you shake it, um, there's beads inside of it, and what happens is that 
um, each medal got louder as you progress. So this is a bronze medal. So it's the quietest of the three, but the gold medal had more beads inside of it. And so if you have time, take, take a chance to uh, look at, you know, Google or whatever, and look up some pictures from the 2016 games. There's actually a lot of imagery of the blind athletes, like leaning down and shaking the medals. And um, it's just making that inclusivity to where now when I'm standing on the podium, that audible cue to me is built in. And I think that that just means so much because it makes you stand up there and not just represent your country and your sport, but it makes it feel like the group that sat down and looked at how are we going to engineer this medal? It made it think they thought of me, right? Yeah. Like I was a yeah. part of that conversation in the room. And I think that that's just so special because it's these types of summits and these conversations that keep that movement happening and really pushing the needle to figure out how do we think about simple solutions that go a long way and impact everyone, not just the disabled community? Just so everyone knows, Tucker's my swim coach now as well, because uh, <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I started learning, <laughs> I started like swimming much more seriously during the pandemic. Uh, you know, just because I actually broke my leg, so I was like, I've got to go and do something else. I started swimming. Honestly, Tucker has taught me so much about swimming. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Uh, right, I'm just like get that out. I have a Paralympic medalist yeah. swim coach out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, Gary, this goes right to the heart of what you were talking about earlier, which is designers want to delight their end user, right? Yeah, you know, totally. and, and the but the idea that it's like it's over and above, you know, what 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 some kind of legal regulation says about accessibility. Of course, that is. That's baseline important. Yeah. You know, people need to understand the, the you know the, the legal requirements. But fundamentally, we want to design beautiful experiences for people and get cool feedback from people that this absolutely. is this is this is working for them. Yeah, absolutely. You well, first, you know, Tucker, as you're telling your story, I just kind of glanced at Rachel and Hector, and I know I was the smiles on our face just hearing that story. That's an incredible yeah. story. That's it's just great that you could share. I also want to lean into something, Rachel, that you said. You referenced a couple of times. You're having the conversation. I think we can all remember in our careers, we didn't have the conversation. 10, 15 oh. years ago, you were almost told, don't have the conversation. You were oh. kind of pushed away from the conversation. And so for me, when I joined oh. Liberty Mutual, it was amazing to see the company was really invested in this. Liberty's been on like a 10-year DEI journey. And specifically in the last couple of years, accessibility has exploded. We're weaving it into the fabric of who we are. Um, it's just, you know, it's amazing to watch. It's inspiring. And back to it, we want to talk about it. We want to include everybody, people that need accommodations, people that just want to be productive, people that just want to help. We're one family. We work real hard. We learn, we grow. And it's just been an amazing journey at Liberty for us. So the fact that we continue the conversation, that is just simply amazing to me. Yeah. And and at some point, all of us as organizations are starting to talk more publicly. I mean, you're here. Like, yep. firstly, thank you. I mean, like, you know, but you're here talking about your journey. That empowers other people to kind of, you know, kickstart their journey a bit more. But eventually we're going to get to the concept of storytelling around the work that you do as an organization. Then Rachel, yeah. like that, that's that's the sort of stuff we've been doing with WPP. Horizon three of my strategy. So horizon one, learn, learn and adopt. Horizon two, build, learn the skills of building accessible. Horizon three, innovate, but tell the story. Don't don't hide the amazing work you do. Yeah. You know, we need to let people know just not just to make progress as professionals, but also organizations are starting to get on the front foot around what they're doing on inclusion. I mean, it's it's a it's a big topic for WPP, right? It is. I mean, yeah, accessibility and inclusion are at the very heart of our organizational culture. They're a core value. Uh, and they have to be, otherwise we'll never get that that diverse workforce who will deliver brilliant creative outcomes for our clients. Yep. And I think that results in some fantastic examples of creative work, whether that's highlighting and provoking action on inequality for some of our clients who really want to take a strong stand on this and provoke a response from their from their customer and their public, um, to the development of new adaptive products, such as the world's yeah. first adaptive deodorant for sure, or mm -hmm. the disability-friendly clothing line for Tommy Hilfiger, which, you know, mm -hmm. are ridiculous that they're their firsts in 2022 and 2023 but they but they are um and it's the it's the fusion of our creativity with that culture and that that value that really spark those, those kind of pushes um to to move whole industries to do better stand up and, and make a difference here and the more that organizations think about the products that they're building for accessibility so gary i mean you're, you're you know when you think about your, your engagement with your customers accessibility is a you know, it's got to be accessible, right? What you, what you deliver, but we need to get more confident to tell the story. 
you know, like tell, you know, get on the front foot on it. You know, don't just wait for people to ask for the accommodation as a customer. We can also start to get on the front foot in terms of delivering inclusive customer experiences. 100%. You know, if I had a magic wand, I would actually make the topic of accessibility go away. It would be something we didn't discuss. And what do I mean by that? It's just what we do, right? We deliver the right tools and technology to the right people at the right time so that they can do their job. We want to enable them so that they can be productive and they can service for us our paying customers, right? That's really what it's about for us. And, you know, you've got to really just keep investing in that, learning, growing, and, and pushing that envelope. But, you know, until then, right, until we can get there, again, we just got to keep listening and moving towards that goal of making it easy. Because I do think about a lot of cases, a lot of folks with accommodations, they don't want to disclose that they need an assistive technology. Mm-hmm. They don't want to disclose to their manager, to their colleagues, because they don't want to be seen in a different light. We need to remove that friction for them, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's a big thing that I'm passionate about right now driving is, again, I want to remove the concept of accessibility to bring it to, these are just tools that we provide for our workforce. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Look, we're going to have to wrap up. I mean, I, I knew this was going to be like this, by the way. <laughs> like, like, it, like, we could talk all day. And, I, and because you're doing real work, Real work is easy to talk about. And, I, and so I just deeply appreciate you coming here and sharing some of the progress you've made this year. It's it's awesome, really awesome work. Um, looking forward, I just want to close with ambitions and asks and like, what do you know, what do you want to see next? Like what 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 do we need to do as Microsoft? What do you know, what can we do together as organizations? Uh, what are your ambitions for for the year ahead? Um, I'm gonna start with you, Tucker. I think for me, the ambitions are similar to what Gary and Rachel have talked about. It's, it's removing that conversation so that it's just the normal. Um, and for me, it's it's having accessibility at the beginning of the conversation when we're building things. It's not an afterthought. Um, and really making that stance of we want to be more inclusive. Um, we launched a campaign internally recently called Who We Are. And so, Gary, when you said that, I was like, oh, those are our, I, I love those buzzwords. And I think mm-hmm. that it's creating that environment. Um, building playbooks to really show what that looks like um, in the workplace. We did that last year in VP and building those standards to make sure that it's getting to the who um, and really making sure that that end user feels inclusive um, and not just hiring more people with disabilities as well, but bringing them in, getting their real firsthand experience rather than trying to build on what we think they would like, get their input, leverage your BRGs, use your internal communities to really see, is this where we are going down that right path or are we not? So I think that using all internal resources, external, having the conversation, being transparent and really leaning on that community to really create change is is where we've got to go. Brilliant. Your ERGs care about what you deliver to your customers. You know, 100%. Almost no more than more than any other group, I think. Um, yeah. Gary, I'm going to leave Rachel to, to last on this one. I know you, so, Gary, over to you. Yeah. No, I mean, Hector, I'd ask that you just keep doing what you're doing. You know, you think about Microsoft and all the tools and technologies that you have out there. You're one of the most admired companies in the world. You're so influential mm-hmm. on technology. And it's great to kind of see this outreach program that you have, right? Uh, this is a passion, you know, as I've talked to you, to Jenny, to others in the organization, you can just see the passion that bleeds through. So just keep it up and help make us better in this space and just continue being an advocate for all um, is all I ask for. Thanks, Gary. Rachel. Look, I think we have a great partnership in this space. I think you've done a fantastic job of building accessibility features into your core Office 365 and Teams yeah, productivity products. You know, I'm looking re- really looking forward to seeing you build those same features into your core engineering build tools. If we can make it easier for our engineers who need accessibility su- support to bring their yeah. voice to and develop solutions, then they'll build better solutions for everyone. So my ask is to embed accessibility features into to that side of your product set. And I know they're coming. I mean, firstly, there's a product team listening to this right now going, yeah, <laughs> you know, absolutely, it's coming. Uh, but there's also a group of people going, a CIO is demanding that. That's what they need to feed back to help mm-hmm. us continue to make these investments and get to where we need to. So, look, this has been awesome. Honestly, this is like a dream for me to kind of, you know, get people with your level of seniority, representation in your organization. You know, not necessarily from organizations that have to do accessibility, but are just doing it because, you know, you're 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 passionate about it and recognize that it feeds into your brand, the culture of your organizations. Remember, CIOs change the culture of organizations you know more almost i'm not gonna say more than anyone but as certainly as much as as anyone 
in partnership with communities. This has been an amazing conversation and we're going to replay this again and again, I know, with uh, with our teams around the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and let's uh, head back to the studio. Thanks. Thank you. Panelists smile. Microsoft. Thank you for participating. There's more to experience. Explore other content experiences in the top navigation bar. In animation, an L-shaped curve of rounded fabric squares undulates softly.